completely privileged to be able to hear uh, Ben Helfgott talk about his remarkable life. Uh, he emerged from Buchenwald and Theresienstadt as a young boy, or a well, 15 year old, um, weighing six stone, and yet he went on to captain the British weightlifting team at two Olympic Games. And beyond that, his life outside of sport has been remarkable and inspirational. I was about to embark on Ben Helfgott's list of achievements, or potted list of achievements. Um, since 1963, he's been chairman of the 45 Aid Society for Holocaust Survivors. Um, since 1982, member of the executive of the Wiener Library. Since 93, trustee of the Board of Management of the Holocaust Education Trust. Since 94, Chairman of Polin, the Institute of Polish Jewish Studies. Since 95, founding patron and member of the advisory group of the Permanent Holocaust Exhibition at the Imperial War Museum. Since 97, member of the executive of the negotiation and allocations committees of the Claims Conference for Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. Since 98, member of the executive of the World Confederation of Holocaust Survivor Organizations. Since 98, again, member of the International Task Force of International Cooperation in a variety of fields relating to Holocaust education, memorialization and research. Um, since 99, a member of the Holocaust Memorial Day Home Office Steering Committee. Since 2000, Vice President of the Claims Conference for Jewish Material Claims. Since 95, a trustee of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust and for much of that time also its treasurer. Since 2005, President of the Yad Vashem Committee of the Board of Deputies. Since 98, uh, President of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. And that is a list of current positions. In the past, he has held uh, positions as joint treasurer of the uh, Central British Fund of the World Jewish Relief. He has also been vice president of Benebrith, England. He's been chairman for the promotion of Yiddish and Yiddish culture. Um, has been chairman of the Yad Vashem Committee of the Board of Deputies. <laughs> and uh, coming to the end of my ability to, to uh, actually list these, uh, council of the member of the Jewish Youth Fund. Um, he has held these positions with courage and it is an astonishing story that you're about to hear. Well, thank you. Can we have a taste of what he has been doing? Who remember the most? I'd like to uh, welcome the rabbi of this synagogue, Dr. Kaplan, uh, who, uh, is, uh, who are uh, who is hosting, his community is hosting us tonight and uh, hosting us on many occasions and it's always a great privilege to be here at your synagogue and to have your wonderful cooperation. I, I feel that we are all privileged to meet such a man because usually when we have people who deal with sports here they talk about their sports activities but I think that as far as Ben is concerned, we cannot talk about sports activity. We have to speak of the man and of his whole experience and be amazed at what he has achieved and how humble he is. I think that the greater the man, the greatest the man is, the more humble he is. And if we need any um, proof for that, we have got it sitting amongst us tonight. So um, Ben really thought that it would be easier for him if he was led by some questions, although I'm sure that he could just speak fluently about his life, but maybe it will break it a bit. 
So, um, you were born in a town in Poland, and we all have a stereotypical picture of how children were growing in a small town in Poland. And what would be interesting, I think, for all of us to know, to what extent your childhood was fitting with the stereotype of Jewish childhood in a small town? Well, my hometown was Piotrkov Trebonalski. It was 42 kilometers north, northeast of Łódź. The population was 55,000, of whom 15,000 were Jewish. Now, it was a very active community, like most communities. It was um, the town as such, was, as far as Poland was concerned, a large town. And thought, but my grandparents were very religious. They belonged to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to very well, so famous Alexander Rebbe, interested in sports from my early childhood. I was very agile, I was very strong. I was stronger than most boys of my age. I was never afraid of a boy who was three or four years older than I. So, so I took to sport a lot. I could catch a ball well, I could kick a ball well. I always challenged boys to run, who is, run, who, who is run, going to run faster, who is going to, to run longest. So we used to have a square where we were running around and who was going to last out longer. So, so this is how I had I my life. But having said this, I was very much aware of everything that was going on around us. From the time that 1936, 96, 97 came, I was listening when, they, when, the, when my parents and the, the people came to us. They were talking about what was happening. Jews were being killed in the... In, in Palestine, it was between 1936 and 39. There was an intifada. It was hardly a week when a Jew wasn't killed, and, um, and of course, anti-Semitism was rising as well. And I was very much aware of it. I was very angry about it. I stopped at the kiosk to read everything that was possibly to be read. So, so by the time the war broke out, when I was maybe 10 years old, or nine years old. So, by that time, I was aware of all the, all the papers, Jewish papers that, were, that existed, national and uh, local, in Poland. Uh, and the fact that the Polish boys would attack us, we would fight, we would run away, then we would chase them, and so on, we throw stones, stones, stones at each other. We, we were fighting them. But the most important thing about it was that um, but more and more, there were everywhere you went. Don't buy in the Jewish shop uh, near Kupu Yuzhida. Um, they, then they were go to Palestine, and that's all, that kind of thing. So, so, so life was, in spite of everything, um, I remember life to me was beautiful. I was only, I was only very upset. That um, what was going on, that, that, that we didn't have the same kind of rights. What are your memories of the first years of the war? Well, I, I really must say that I, at the time the war broke out and with what was happening, I, I, lost, I lost my childhood. I was like a grown up. I was aware of everything that was going on around, going on. I wanted to know about everything, and um, and so so that's why that's what happens. And so so so, so I so, so the, and then and the, when the war broke out, of course, um, we it so happened that on the day when the war broke out, we were on holidays. The, the planes were constantly attacking, throwing throwing bombs, and. Um, and that, um, and we had to stop, and we had to, the, the bus had stopped, and we had to run to the to the to the forest. And the following day, uh, on the second day of Saturday, the town the town was bombed, 
and when the town was won to everybody, decided to run in the east, in the east direction. Also, we heard that the, that, the, that the German army is galloping. They, they, they're running, they, they, they'll soon be around in, in our town. So, so, um, so we also went and we finished up in a place called Suleyov, which was 15 kilometers away. It was a small town with 5,000 people lived. Half of them were Jews, half of them were, were Poles. And when we got there, of course, everything was a beautiful day, a summer day, and then people were walking in the street, unlike in my town, when everybody was, um, uh, in, 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 was hiding. And, um, and so my parents decided to stay. A few hours later, in the late afternoon, without any alarm or anything, bombs started falling. They were incendiary bombs. And within a very short time, the whole place was one big conflagration, everything around. People were running, we, it was surrounded by, by woods, so people were running to the woods, and they were, and on the, on the way they were being killed, and, 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 uh, and in the woods when we got there, when we were running there, when we got there, it was terrible scenes were going on, because when people were escaping, they used to be with their family, they lost their family. And when they got into the woods, they started screaming, shouting, calling out for their, their names. So you have Polish names, Jewish names, and people were, were injured, people coming up, helping, and so on. It was terrible, terrible things, you can't imagine. And so it finished, and we carried on going further, until in a few days' time, we were caught up by the Germans. So we went back to our home. And when we got back to our home, we heard that they have, um, as the Germans came, they came, went straight to the synagogue. They took out the Machsori Manette, the, 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 the holy books, and they burned them, and they put fire to, to, to the houses across the road, and then they shot 30 people, of whom was Rabbi as well. And so then we came back. Uh, it's about uh, on the seventh or eighth day it was, we heard that. And then, within a very short time, they arrested the um, uh, leaders of the town, 12 leaders, and they asked ransom. And then how could you give them a ransom when all, everything that anybody had in the bank was, was taken away? It just didn't belong to us anymore. But somehow, they found some, they found it, and they, re and, they were, and they were released. But in a very short time, at the end of the month, September, they, uh, they were all over the town uh, announcements that Jews must be moved, must moved into the ghetto. And the ghetto, and, and by the 1st of November, we lived out outside the ghetto, so of course we had to, my father had a big job try and find a suitable place because uh, there were 15,000 Jews and then in the, in the, in the, the ghetto were living about 5,000 5, people and so um, it was very difficult to find something very, very livable but anyway my father managed uh, but what happened as a result of the, after a little while people from surrounding areas order to move into the ghetto as well. And those who lived in the western part of Poland, which was now incorporated into the Third Reich, many of them came to my hometown. And by, by the end of the year, when we already lived there, there were 28,000 Jews living in the ghetto. And, um, and of course, this, this caused epidemics, type of epidemics. Uh, by 1940 already, uh, had to, uh, people had to be taken out from their homes. It was, it was terrible to live under these conditions. Tell us about each member of your family, because uh, what happened to them during the war, and obviously how you have survived yourself. Uh, well, my father uh, was a very enterprising man. He had a lot of courage to do what he did. Uh, you were able to get 
passes to go outside the ghetto. And they, some, some, were, some were legal, some, and some were, were, were false. And, um, and this was a false path, but nevertheless he used it. And he arranged the smuggling of flour into the ghetto. And, um, and this he did with power. He couldn't do it. He, he wasn't carrying it on his back, and he never brought it in. It's Pauls who smuggled it in, and of course they were paid for it. And that is, and that is what he was doing. And I, my mother was up, and they sometimes didn't come back home. And in the meantime, we heard that people were being killed outside. And my mother was pleading with him not to, not to, uh, to, to, to do that. He said, I've got to look after you, and this is how I'm going to do it, and he didn't do so. So he had contact with Paul outside, and of course when it came to the time, in 1942, when people were talking about the mutations, then um, um, what to do, uh, the people tried to get a job. There were uh, two, big, two large factories in my hometown. Uh, one place where they, uh, there were a thousand people working, in Pauls mainly to start off with, but then choose what to do. And about the glass factory, two, two glass factories where 650,000 uh, were living. So uh, by, the, by that time, uh, my father decided that uh, he said we're going to go into hiding, to outside, outside the ghetto. And, and I went to work in the glass factory at the age of 12, 12th of August 1942. And my first, I looked forward to it because I wanted to know what it's like to work, and especially the glass factory. It was, hum, it was very hot. And I, was, I was working on a night shift, and I had a very bad night because first of all, my mother begged me to sleep during the day, but I was out running around playing with, with other, other, other boys and um, I didn't sleep and then I was very tired, I didn't do my job properly, so at the time I was kicked and so on. So I had a tap, so when I came home, my parents insisted that I don't go back, but I back and worked there. But very soon the deportation took place in my hometown um, and my father and my mother were going to, and I, was going to be in hiding as well. But it so happened that I worked on the night shift and, um, and then and when I came back, and then in the morning the night shift was finished, I was stopped from going back. So, and my parent, my father actually that same evening took my mother out with my aunt, my mother's younger sister, who actually married about a week before. And so, so they managed to manage to save them, and this is how we were saved in the first place. After a week, I came back from the glass factory, and you simply cannot imagine, I don't think anybody can imagine, because when I think back of that moment, I had, we had to go through the ghetto. By that time, the ghetto was empty, and in the, in the center of the ghetto used to be um, they had only two half streets, uh, which I put around barbed um, wire. The 2,500 people were going to live. Before the war, probably about three to 400 people were living in, in these two streets, not even that. Now we were all living there. But coming back and walking in the, the ghetto, we got the small ghetto, it was completely empty. I walked out to work, I was in my clothes, I didn't have anything else, a few slotters that I always said my father gave me, and that was it. I never got anything afterwards, just everything, you're not allowed to go there, get anything. And so, but that was not the point. The point was that just to look at this, it, 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 it was such, such, such quietness that Nobody was around anymore. And when I finally got to the, to the air where the small ghetto was, I looked around. Everybody was gone. Most of my friends, my uncles were in my class, 
no, nobody, nobody was left behind. They went, they were deported with their families. It was an emptiness that was really something so terrible. This, this is something that any, nobody can imagine. And of course, one was pleased that one was alive at that moment, because it was a miracle that anybody arrived. It was, a, it was alive. Um, and then the following day, my father immediately found himself a, a job uh, where they put down that he was <coughs> legal. Because anybody who was not there during the time of the deportation was not allowed to live. They were going around to every house, wherever, in the ghetto, searching for people who were in hiding and taking them out, and then putting them on the train to another town where they were sent together with them. All of them were sent to Treblinka. 450,000 Jews were, were killed. About two or three weeks, they announced that any Jew who saved himself should, should, um, should register so that they will become legal and they will get a job and because they needed people for that. But as soon as they came, they rounded them up and then them was my mother and my two sisters and, um, and they took them to the synagogue and they collected 530 uh, of them. The synagogue at this stage was outside the ghetto, but it was only about 150 yards away from where we were. So we, since they were, we, could, we could see everything because of the, of the barbed wire, so we, so we could always stand there and watch what was happening in the synagogue, who was coming out, who was coming in. And anyway, for two weeks, uh, they were, the SS was the, trying to make a decision what to do, and then they made a decision, and the decision was the 20th of December, they took out 530 people uh, to the nearby woods, it was only about a mile and a half away, about a couple kilometers, not even that, and they took them all out on a Sunday morning, Sunday the 20th, and they shot them all. And that was the first time that, uh, that, that um, I felt an emptiness again that took me a long time to get out of it. And so it, so it went on. During this period, you know, it reminds me when I, in history, one talks about in the, during the time of the French Revolution, the time that they were taking, <coughs> where they were taking the people to the, to the guillotines. This was exactly the same. It was all the time. There wasn't a day when somebody wasn't killed. Some, some, they killed two Jewish policemen because they tried to save their parents and they let them lie there at the entrance where we all came in from work. And we all had to look and, 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 and be told, if you do anything, if you hide somebody, this is what we're going to do to you. So that is talking, talking about what has happened in the meantime, we were there till the end of July, 1943, and then they decided to liquidate the ghetto. 300 were sent straight away to Buchenwald, and I was together with my father. And, um, and I was together with my father, and he was supposed to be, was supposed to be sent from there to another place where they were manufacturing anti-tank weapons. That was 1944, of the end of that. Anyway, um, so, um, and then when they called us, and we began to Buchenwald, then we went to Buchenwald, we uh, stayed there for a week, and then they called out the numbers, because they're no longer, names didn't exist. And they called out my number, and then the rating for my father's number it wasn't called out, and then we ordered to walk. I tried to, to, to run to my father, I was stopped, there was nothing that could be done, and now I was without my father. And um, it was a great blow, as you can imagine. And so then the 
sent our son to the strike that were producing the tank weapon. And that with that, it was a terrible, terrible place because now we were not worried about being killed because they were not, nobody was thinking of killing us. But we were just dying from hunger and from, and from being eaten by lice and uh, bugs and not have changing our clothing. No, we had no, no change of clothing from the time we were at the beginning of December in Buchenwald at the time they sent us uh, to the Redenstadt when we arrived on the 21st of April 1945. And now, why did they send us to, to, to the Redenstadt? The war was almost ended. It's always coming to an end. Yeah, it's But they were sending the, the Jews because they were going to destroy them. Mm -hmm. Because the commandant of Tredestadt was ordered to build a gas chamber. And, this, and the, our salvation was that the, the, the people who worked there managed to inform somehow the, the Red Cross. And the Raptors had heard about it. They, told, they went to the commander and they told him that if he continues to do that, he'll be the first one to be hacked. The war was coming to an end. So he stopped it. And that is the meetup. Group after group, mainly people who were coming on the death march, were coming in. And I, and I thought we looked bad. When they were coming in, after a year, they may have walked for three weeks, for two weeks, <coughs> most of them on the way died. And they all finished up there. And there were 15,000 of these people from the death march who arrived between the 20th of April 1945 till we were liberated on the early morning of the 9th of, of May 1945. Now, just a few days before I was, we were liberated, uh, one of the groups that came in turned out to be where my father was later sent to another camp and uh, he was working in, and he was on the same death, death march. And I, and, I, and I learned from somebody that, um, the, that in the way uh, they were very near, that the, the, the fighting was very near, my father and a few others decided to run away. They called them and they shot them. So as you can imagine, my liberation was tinged with great sadness. I couldn't, I was happy that I, that I at last been liberated, but at the same time, I kept thinking about my father, because to me he was a hero from my early childhood. He was the most wonderful father. Most, most children say so about fathers. But my father was a very special, special man. Good-hearted, always helped others, and I, I learned a lot from him. I, I am alive today because of my father. How was it to be a child coming to England without a language, without a family? What happened when you came? And how did you adjust yourself? Well, I, I wanted to do what I always liked doing. I wanted to study, I wanted to, come to, to, do, to, 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 to catch up with my lost education. I didn't go to school for six years. And, um, but I nevertheless wanted very much to, 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 to do that. And of course I wanted to do a lot of sport, which I did. We were here, Michael Nissman, he was a lawyer at the time. And, um, still, and yes. I, already, yes. I, <laughs> and I already knew him by 1963 because I was already involved at that time with the Maccabea. I was on the, I was not only competing, but I was also in the Maccabia And you know that Martin Gilbert has written mm. the famous book, The Boys, about you. Um, we have looked at the Jewish side of yours, but uh, since it is a series which we are calling Jews in Sports, we would like to know something about your sports life, and particularly about your unbelievable achievements as a boy just coming after the Holocaust 
and achieving so much uh, within the British society? Well, as I said, I did a lot of sport. The sport that I would have liked to have competed was actually gymnastics. So, and so I came to waitressing by chance um, uh, during my holidays, summer holidays. Uh, we used to go very often to Hampstead Teeth, and we used to go to a place which was a swimming pool, open swimming pool, and uh, for men only. And one day I saw a group of people lifting weights with a coach, and I got up and watched them, and I asked the coach whether I can lift the weight. And he said to me, have you ever lifted weight? I said, no, not, not, not this. So, and do you know how much is on there? I said, yes, 140 pounds. So he said, no, I can't let you because it's too heavy. But I insisted, and then he said, I don't take any responsibility. Then I went up, I cleaned it in with my shoulders very easily, and I pressed it up quickly. And I put it down well, and he said to me, you've never lifted weights? I said, no. He said, you are, you are natural. And so when we get back to the club, so young is a club leader, and he immediately said, well, we're going to start a, a, a weightlifting section. And he got together the weights, he got together a coach, it happened to be a Jewish coach, <coughs> and that is how we started. And then there was a time when we were talking about the Maccabiah games. And um, the, the, the post of Maccabiah was going to be in 1950. And there were three, two Maccabiahs before, before the war. And um, now they wanted to keep, to, keep the, to, to continue, and which they were which doing, they, they continue to do it. And so I, 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 I applied for it, and I, and I, had, I went for the trials, and when I went for the trials, it was Maccabi. At that, that moment, I had Maccabi, <coughs> but I never went to Maccabi. I didn't have time to go to Maccabi. I had my own club and I, to, and I had my studies and set sport and so on. So, um, so when I made this thing, you have to give a poundage that you're going to do. And when I gave my poundage, my first attempt, you have three attempts. And so, so, so that they all looked at me that I was crazy because they all finished doing lifting 175 pounds. 160, 170, 175 is most, and I started off with 190 for my first attempt. And for my second attempt, I took 200. And for my third attempt, I took 210, which would have broken the British record. And I went to the Maccabia game. This was my first competition. My second competition was the Maccabia, and here again, I won it. So I came back a big hero. I had a, I had a letter from from the Maccabi, from Maccabi to come and join their club. <laughs> and so that's how I continued. And I, and the third, my, third, my third competition, I was um, the home counties champion. And so very quickly I was near the top. And then I, for seven years, from 1954 to 1960, I was British champion. And I competed every year in, in, in international world championships. Two Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, Commerce Games, I won a bronze medal, and so on. Now, I actually only wanted to become a British champion. And um, because I had other interests. Uh, I, I, was, I was an amateur. Uh, I was interested, I was, apart from making my career to have a future, because that, this didn't give me a future. And mm -hmm. I, I, if, I would never become a professional because I didn't want to be a professional. Without a bit of arrogance, with love for people, with humility, with the, even building bridges between Jews and Poles, for which he is renowned, he got the medal, I don't know, I don't hear if you mentioned the, the great honor that he has got from the Polish government for what he is doing. 
I think that it's really, for me, it's a legendary person that one meets only once. Don't forget that 45 children in my class, 45 children, I've only discovered last week, I always thought there were 32, but I happened to get some from my hometown, somebody came across in, in, the, in, the, in the archives, the names of the boys and girls in my class, and the, and, and the reports of our class that year. I just sat out of the blue, and I always thought we had 45, 32, 45 children. Two of us, two of us survived. Now, I, 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 I've never forgotten them. They, they come to my mind again and again and again. And you know, I don't want to forget them, because, because I wouldn't be worthy of living. I was lucky. That was, that was what it was. I was lucky. It could have gone, I could have been finished so many times, but I was lucky. And because of my luck, I don't want to waste my time. And I want to make sure that no children go through what, what those of us who survived, what we have gone through. Mm -hmm. Because that is, that is something that nobody will ever understand. You cannot understand fear unless you, unless you have fear about your life. You, cannot, you, you only begin to understand when you see people who have been religious, who haven't been religious their whole life, and they go to the hospital, and then you go to visit them, and you see they, that, that they, they were the couple, and they were and they have the, and they have the, 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 the fiddle in their hand to pray. That is fear, it's fear, and 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 we went through worse fears than that. Very fear. Ben, I, when I listen to you, you know, all the admiration and love I feel for you. I, what impresses me so much is how positive you are and what you, the message that you give to all of us isn't having gone through everything you've gone through there's no hatred i don't know what hatred means exactly it, it's all positive it's about individuals it's about people it's it's spreading your love of life your knowledge your experience with everybody in, you know whether it's through sport whether it's through community things whether it's through family and i think that's the big message you give, give us you know, you're just such a total human being who's, who's been through so much and it's enriched your life rather than, you know, sort of maybe you haven't turned in on yourself, you've never become bitter, you know, you've used it in such a positive way and I think that's a message that everybody should really treasure. Yeah. Mm.